Amen. Good morning, Growing Faith Fellowship. Good morning, guys. Enjoy the praise and worship this morning. Amen. We also want to welcome our those who are watching online as well. It's good to be back. It's been a while. I feel like I haven't been here in a while. Vacation, kids, celebrations. My wife, I last week and celebrated our 20, 20th anniversary and her birthday. So we lumped it all in together. You know, we lumped it all in um, together. And so uh, just good to be back. Um, she will be here, but a friend came in town really late last night, so they're back at the house. So Terrence said, Pastor T text me, I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to come, and I hadn't, hadn't been there in a while, so it's old folks that me come and lay my eyes on everybody. <laughs> but uh, we're the part of our service, uh, one of my favorite parts is communion. And I think it's something that uh, it always humbles me to do communion, because it's just a reminder of the goodness of God. And when I thought about it, uh, last actually last Sunday, uh, my wife and I we had the chance to uh, to visit uh, Oak Cliff uh, Fellowship uh, with Pastor Tony Evans. We were there, and he was. I caught him on his last Sunday before he went on vacation, so I caught him on the last Sunday before he went out. And um, he was finishing up a series called "The Judgment Seat of Christ." He was coming out of the book of um, Galatians, if I'm not mistaken. But he was talking about choices, and when I think about that, this word choices, that God has given us the freedom to choose. We're not robots. We're not some beings where we're programmed to uh, really do just one particular thing. But he has given us the freedom to choose. And, and we started off humanity on the wrong foot. You know, we decided to choose to understand and to live life and and to experience life apart from God. And with that choice came a, a lot of consequences that yet that the earth itself is even suffering from. And sometimes we think about, you know, why does God allow these things? And we always talk about, you know, God chooses, but we choose as well. And we make these choices that at the end of the day, we make good choices, make bad choices. We make the right choice or the wrong choice. Sometimes we make choices not to even make a choice, but that's still a choice because we chose not to choose to do what we want to choose to do. It's still a choice. And we live in a world where everything is bombarding us and we have to choose. Do I go this way? Do I go that way? Do I believe this? Do I believe that? Should I say that's okay? Life is full of choices. And God kept it so simple from the beginning because all he just said was, choose me. If you choose me, then life would be a lot more simpler. Not that life wouldn't be hard, but it'd be a lot more simpler. And so I thought about choices because we made the wrong choice. What God did choose to do besides to end us from day one, he chose to love us. And he chose to save us, to redeem us. And you see it no more evident in John chapter 10 we just real quick, and I'm going to go into the communion. John chapter 10, verse 17 through 18, Jesus says he's talking about the good shepherd. That's what he's talking about in this whole text, the good shepherd. He says, the father loves me because I sacrifice my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. For this is what my father has commanded. Jesus telling disciples and those listening that I have the power to choose. What greater power to choose when I die? None of us have that power. We try over years to stay healthy, you know, work out, Brother John, and we try to eat right. We try to do things because really deep down inside, we're trying to live longer on this side. If truth be told, we want to look young, feel young. I, I worked out with my son last week. We did a leg workout, and it's a week later, and my legs still hurt. Because I reminded myself, you're not 24 anymore. You're 44. You know, back then, Rob, I could work out, and two days later, man, I'm since I was struggling. I'm still struggling a little bit. Let's get a little bit better. 
But we do things because we want to extend our life here. Because the reality is, is that we know we don't have the power to raise ourselves up when we die. And Jesus says, which is so confirming, he says that no one takes my life. I choose to lay it down. Not because it benefits me, because it'll benefit you. Let us have the mind of Christ to lay down the old things. Let those things die away. And I love because if Jesus had not decided to lay down his life, there would be no hope for us. There would be no hope. And so he goes into the Last Supper and he's telling his disciples. Now remember, he just preached this thing to them and then now he's talking about the time has come. I'm about to lay my life down. And for some reason, I guess they weren't paying attention in class. They were sleeping because Peter's like, ain't nobody taking you out, Jesus. But I did tell you not too long ago, they're not going to kill me. I'm going to lay my life down. So you should be woke in class when the teacher's teaching. And he was asleep. I guess he was dozing off. And, and, and Jesus reminds him, no, what I said, it's about to happen. You're about to witness me lay down my life. Because I know I have the power through the Father to pick it back up. And so when we take communion, we take the bread. He said, this is my body. When we eat this, it's a reminder that, that Christ chose to be beaten. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't knee on matrix and dodge the, the whips. He sit there like Kevin Hart said, he, he did it with his chest. He took it. He chose to be beaten. They cut his flesh. They mocked him because he allowed them. He chose for them to do it. And he blessed it. They took the cup and said, this is my blood. And he chose to bleed for us. He chose to allow the wounds, the whips to hit him and, and pierce his flesh black, back and let the blood run. He could have just seized it up and stopped the bleeding, but he allowed his skin to be broken and for the blood to run out because he loved us. Amen. They took the cup and they drank. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for choosing salvation for us. We thank you for choosing to pay the penalty that we could not pay. We, cho we thank you for choosing to afflict pain on your own body so that we may not experience the judgment of you. We thank you, God, that you chose love. We had nothing to offer. We still have nothing to offer, but you chose us. Thank you today, God, for choosing us. And God, we choose to follow you. We choose to surrender. We choose to humble ourselves before you. We, even today, God, we choose to open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts today, God. Open our eyes. Give us a, a spirit to receive what you have today. Bless the man of God as he come and speak life into us through your word. We choose, God, to receive your word today. And these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, somebody give God praise today. Amen. Aren't you glad that he chose... To forgive your sins. I thought I'd have a few more people more excited about that. Praise God. Aren't you glad that he chose to forgive your sins, your iniquities? Amen. I am so grateful uh, for God's goodness towards me. And uh, man, when I think about his goodness, my soul leaps. I am I am full of gratitude and, and thanksgiving and uh, and I'm just very thankful to be here today because it didn't have to be. There was nothing that I did to to earn the right to be here, but it was by his grace and mercy. <laughs> Praise God. It says it is because of the Lord's mercies 
that we are not consumed. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I'm grateful to be able to uh, stand before you today and get ready to get into the word. Before I do, I wanted to share a couple of announcements with you. Uh, announcement number one, wanted to uh, let the parents know, don't fret. Student ministry comes back next week. Come on. Come on, parents. Won't you celebrate that today? Kids, we're excited. We're looking forward to have one of the uh, youth walk up today. And say, are we going to that room today? And I said, well, not today, but starting next week, you're going to be back in student ministry. Can we celebrate that for a moment? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Want to also um, bring to your attention that uh, we're, we're in the midst of praying about something in particular that I want to invite you to be praying about. And it's, it's what we refer to as project renovation. Uh, as many of you know, coming out of the, the pandemic, um, there, there's a lot of changes when it relates to ministry. A lot of things have changed. And so our objective, our desire is to begin to evaluate how do we do ministry post the pandemic? Or really, we're still in the midst of a pandemic, but how do we move forward and go forward in ministry? Isn't that a good thing to be praying about? Yes, we want to be skillful in how we reach our community, skillful at how we do ministry. And so in the midst of that, we're not changing the message, but we may have to change the method. <laughs> Amen. Last week was a prime example of that. Last week, was a great opportunity for us to come and, and, and spend time together in a very unique way where the gospel was preached. Did you all enjoy movie day last week? Did y'all enjoy that? Amen. Praise God. We, we are overcomers. Somebody shout with me. I'm an overcomer. Yes, I'm an overcomer. Mm-hmm. And we got the chance to see that illustrated last week. And so we just thank God for that. Uh, another thing I would like to share with you is I want to say thank you. I want to thank you for your continued partnership. And here's why. Last week, that event cost over $1,300. Let me just let that sit there. 1300 And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like to spend money on certain things. You know, certain things I like to spend money on, right? But certain things I'm just like, ah, I can be a little, you know, I can be a little bean counter, right? But praise God, last week we were able to have, host that event. People were able to have popcorn and a drink and come and enjoy a great environment and fellowship. And it's because of your generosity. Can you celebrate today? Come on. Let me, I really want you to give yourself a hand clap. Praise God. And there are so many other things that by your because of your generosity, we're able to do. We're able to partner with an organization that I work for called Care Portal, where we're able to help families that are in crisis, children who have been separated from their families, children who are in the midst of financial hardship and the burden that comes with that is because of your faithfulness that we can do that. And I just want to celebrate you today. <laughs> Praise God. And do you know there are people that come and help set up? You know, this is not something that just happens automatically. You know, it, this is not something that just poof, man, praise God, we got lights and we got uh, cameras set up and shit. That requires somebody shout with me work. Yes. And so because of faithful uh, work and serving of uh, individuals, I just want to celebrate you and give God thanks for your continued contribution. Amen. Well, praise God. Well, let's get into our word today. I'm so excited about today's message. We're having celebrating and, and going through a new sermon series called Pursuit. And uh, Pursuit is ultimately about the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God changes everything. Uh, I've been asked if the only thing that you could preach for the rest of your life, what would you preach about? And the one thing that I would preach about would be the kingdom of God. And here's why. Jesus, his entire ministry was marked by teaching and preaching what? The kingdom of God. And so what we want to do is we want to be faithful to the word of God and teach the things that Jesus taught about. I know that we want to live our best life now, but can I tell you? Jesus wasn't thinking about your best life now. 
He wasn't. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, but I have come that you might have life, and life what? More abundantly. Can I tell you, he wasn't talking about cars and shoes and clothes, but he was talking about living a life that's meaningful, a life that is impactful, a life that will live beyond our present reality. And that's, I don't know about you, but that's what I want for my life. And so as we talk about the kingdom, the one thing that I hope that we understand is that the kingdom changes everything. It's the kingdom of God that changes everything. And I realize that people are in search of something. And people may not realize what it is that they're looking for, but they are in search of something more. In fact, that's what our mission as a faith community is, is that we are leading people searching for more into a thriving relationship with God. Because can, can I tell you today, I don't care how much money you have in the bank, you're always going to realize that there's something missing. I don't care how beautiful your house is or how fancy your car is or how many friends you have that follow you on social media. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, what's going to all boil down to is that there's a, a, a void in your heart. And this is a God-sized void that only he can fill. And so this is why Jesus instructs us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things that we have need of, God says, I'm going to add them. But don't make the pursuit of your life to be focused on something we just talked about it a few weeks ago. That's hevel, that cannot be grasped. And so today, I want us to begin to talk through what is the kingdom? Because here's, here's what I'm going to uh, share today, that the kingdom, I can't pursue the kingdom if I don't know what the kingdom is. And so, so I want to begin to unpack exactly what is the kingdom because after all Jesus instructed us to seek first the kingdom and so as I prayed family and asked God to help me to explain the kingdom he said what I want you to do is I want you to begin to take the kingdom and begin to dissect it and I want you to take certain aspects of the kingdom to help you to unwrap and unveil exactly what the kingdom is. So the word that we're going to focus on today is a word, a very simple word, and it's the word governance. Governance. The word governance is a method of management. And, and as I began to think on that word governance, I started thinking about, well, what's the reason? What's the purpose of governance? When, what are the instances of governance? Now, and I, I thought back about my childhood. And how there were times that my mom and dad had these rules that they wanted me to follow. And, and I remember thinking this way, Shalina. I remember thinking, I can't wait to get out of my parents' home because I don't want to follow their rules. Now, perhaps you're something like me where you too have thought the same thing. I can't wait to get on my own because I want to live by my own rules, right? I, you know... I want to do like different different strokes. Y'all remember the, the, the uh, theme song, the different strokes? Now the world just don't move at the beat of just one drum. What might be right for you may not be right for some. Y'all remember that? Y'all sitting there looking at it like y'all remember that song. Well, well, maybe I was the only one that watched the different strokes. But, but, but here's what I discovered, that all of us want to live life on our own terms. And, and the reason that we want to live life on our own terms is because that's what's natural. We naturally rebel against the rules in general. If you tell your kids, hey, make sure that you don't spit in the pool. That all of a sudden the pool looks attractive. And for whatever the reason, I want to spit in the pool, right? We are naturally rebellious. And, and, and I, I hope that for a moment you would just accept the reality that 
in your human condition, you naturally rebel. And, and, and that's, that's dangerous when we naturally rebel. So, so I, wanna, I want us to hammer down this idea of why we need governance. Why do we need it? Well, we could not look too far. We could just look at our children, right? Look at our children, and we can see we need to give our children rules and boundaries. Why? Because we want to protect them. We want to ultimately ensure that they don't do things that will ruin their lives before it gets started. Is that true, parents? I wish I had a few more parents that were just saying, praise. Yeah, yes, Lord. Yeah, that's what I want for my kids. We also want to help give our kids principles to help them live life in a way that's profitable, right? We, we also want to give our children this, this perspective and perception of life because when you are a child, things look different. Am I right about it, parents? When you are a child <laughs> going places, doing things, you don't put money uh, on it, right? I remember when my, my brother told his, his kids, hey, we're going to go to Disney World or Disneyland. I don't know which one it is. I get confused. Is it the one in Florida or is it the one in California? I'm not sure, but it was one of the Disney places. And, and I, but what I understand about Disney, whatever, I understand that Disney is expensive. I understand. Oh, sorry, I knew I'd get a good witness. I see a couple of heads. Yes, Lord, it is expensive. And when my brother shared that, hey, we going to Disney, whatever, my niece started telling people, we going to Disneyland. Is it Disneyland? Or was it Disney? No, say y'all looking like the world, brother. It's Disney World. She started telling everybody, we going to Disney World. She's only focused on Disney World. Whereas my brother, he thinking about how much it's going to cost, how much, it, how much, how we going to get there, what we going to do when we get there. You mean to tell me they got these passes that you got to pay extra for to skip the lines. Oh, man. He's thinking about all of this while my niece, she don't have to worry herself with all of that, right? So, so what I'm trying to say is that we see the world differently when we don't understand perspective. But here's what grandmama used to say. You'll understand it better by and by. And so when we talk about governance, governance is a method of management. And it's a method of management to help us to be protected, to have the right perspective, to develop principles that's going to help us live a life that's healthy. So the number one reason we need governance is because of our hearts, our wildly hearts. So in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, it says this about the heart. It says the heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Can I tell you today, and I hope this encourages you, our hearts are desperately sick. Our human heart desperately needs the governance of the word of God because otherwise, without it, we'll do things all messed up. Now, let me see if I can help, under, help you to understand where I'm coming from. So I have the privilege of serving on my uh, HOA board for our community. And our HOA board is designed to give structure to our community. And sometimes what happens is that people want to do things that are outside of the governing documents. The governing documents is what we refer to as our bylaws. And the bylaws give structure and responsibility of people that live in the community. Is that making sense so far? Well, every now and again, people get upset with us as the, <laughs> as the people that are on the HOA board, they get upset with us for what's in the governing documents. As a HOA board member, my only responsibility is to execute what's in the governing documents. So that protects us from people having their own opinion, 
Because imagine if there were no HOA governing documents. People would do whatever they wanted to do, and I'm going to give you one example. They'll stop cutting their grass, some people. They'll, stop, they'll paint their house any way that they want. They'll, they'll have all kinds of animals and pets, you know, <laughs> lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. You have chickens and turkeys, you know, <laughs> beans, greens, tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you name it, right? I mean, that, we'll have all kind of stuff. And, and the problem that we'll create is that it'll cause the neighborhood to go down. It'll cause property values to go down. It'll cause people who don't want to deal with that to move out and open the doors for bad characters to move in and ultimately become and render the community unsafe. So you see, at the top of that was government. Now, I'm going to talk about this in later series, but there is a difference between God's government and the world's government. In the United States, we submit to what's called democracy, where in God's government is called theocracy. In other words, we elect our officials and their terms are limited, whereas in God's government. He is not elected. He is the established authority. He, in other words, he's the king. And sometimes it's hard for us that live in a democracy to think in terms of what does it feel like or look like to live under a kingdom where I don't get to vote on how things go. I don't get to say, I don't agree with that. I'm not doing that. I'm going to do it this way. <laughs> I don't get to do it that way, right? Whereas in our democracy, we have a voice. We have a vote. And I don't like what this politician is doing, and I'm going to vote him out. But can I tell you, we serve a God who can't be voted out. We serve a God who leads, he rules, and it's because his way is right and it's true. It's not going to become unpopular someday. His way of rule and authority and leadership is very clear and established, and it's designed to protect us. It's designed to give us right principles, and it's designed to give us the right perspective on life. Who can I teach today? So when we're talking about the governance of the kingdom of God. This is why Jesus says, I need you to seek the governance of the word of God because that's what's going to give your life structure. Because most of us, we don't need, we don't have a problem with life other than the fact we just lack the structure of the word. So that's what we're going to be talking through today. So for the next few minutes, what I'm going to uh, begin to unpack is to illustrate how Jesus taught kingdom so that he could correct our perspective. Make sense? Okay, so what we're going to study from this morning is from Mark chapter 7. For the rest of our time together, from Mark chapter 7, and we're going to look at Verses 14 through 23. OK, now remember, I, I'm hoping that from this text, what we will see is why Jesus preached kingdom. Because he's trying to correct my perspective. And this is why I started off explaining we have to know that our hearts are wildly. Our hearts are untrustworthy. Have you ever heard somebody say, I feel led to do this? And you looking like, man, you, you feel led, but that's not the word of God that's leading you. That is your heart. Mm, OK, so here it is where Jesus says in verse 14, and he called the people to him again and said to them, hear me. Somebody shout, hear me. Hear me, he says, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person 
or what defiled him. Now, it's important that you understand some context. So Jesus and his disciples are out taking care of some business and they decide they're going to grab them a little something to eat. And they start eating without washing their hands. Now, that's not a good practice. But that is not what causes me to be sinful. And so the the Pharisees saw this happening and they said, Jesus, your disciples are eating with unclean hands. Thus, they are defiling themselves. And so Jesus took that as an opportunity to address and deal with a misconception, a, a, a errored perception and perspective. And here's what he was dealing with. When when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, God gave them governance. He gave them laws. Y'all remember the Ten Commandments, right? But there were over 604 laws that God gave, not so that he could control them, but because he wanted to establish that, hey, you are separated. Somebody shout separated. You are set apart. You are sanctified, right? And one of the ways that God chose to set apart his people was to give them governance on what they ate. Now, that wasn't to determine whether or not they were clean. That was to demonstrate that, hey, here's what, where you are different. And, and I don't know about you, but sometimes on this journey, I feel different. Is there anybody here today that feel different sometimes? Right. You at you at work, you in your community and you're not responding the way other people are responding. You're being mistreated, dogged out, talked about, dealing with issues. And yet you are still trusting God and not lashing out. Aren't you glad about being different today? Praise God. Right. The reason that you're different is because you're living under a different kingdom. And because you're living under a different kingdom, you're living under a different perception, perspective, principles and practices. Right. So Jesus is beginning to explain, hey, listen, y'all think that what causes a person to be defiled is what goes into him. Well, I'm here to tell you today that not what goes into you is what defiles you, but it's what comes out of you. Come on. So Jesus is getting ready to correct a false perspective. Woo! I'm just going to just preach today myself happy today because I don't know about you, but there have been things in my life that the Holy Spirit has come and arrested me and say, hey, this is how you're thinking about it. And you're wrong. This is how you see it. And you don't have the right perspective of it. Can I define perception for a moment? Perception is a lens or a mindset from which we view life. We believe what we perceive to be accurate. And we create our own realities based on those perceptions. Have you ever heard it said that a person's perception, help me, is their reality, right? This is what I perceive and this is what my reality is. I always like to tell this story to illustrate this. um, We had a cousin that came in town, a great man of God. I love this brother. And and so Cindy and I, we were newlyweds and all we had was a one bedroom apartment. But we invited him to come and stay at our apartment and uh, we slept in the living room on the sofa. He slept in our room. And and that morning he was getting ready. And I kind of caught a glimpse of him getting dressed uh, in my room or getting putting his stuff in his bag. And, And what I saw was he was tucking away this bottle of curved cologne in his bag. He was tucking it away. I thought, huh, that's strange. I have some cologne just like that. And, and so uh, I, we took him to the airport and, and later, a few days ago, I was looking for my curve. <laughs> and I instantly remembered I saw him tucking away curve in his bag. He done stole my cologne. Is what I, <laughs> he, he stole my cologne and instantly my perception of him began to change. And I started thinking, he's supposed to be a man of God. And before I knew it, <laughs> I was, I, I, well, I had reduced him. I mean, he was up, <laughs> well, I, brought, I had brought, isn't that what we do to people? We don't know what's going on in their life. We make decisions based on them and we reduce them. We bring them on down. And I brought this man all the way down. And later that day, I was getting ready, putting me some lotion on. I grabbed the lotion and Behind the lotion was my cologne. 
You see, my perception was my reality. And here it is, even though it wasn't true. And there are things about our perception that's just wrong and we don't know it. So Jesus says, I need you to seek the kingdom because that's the only thing that's going to correct it. Come on, give God praise right there. Come on. That's the only thing that's going to get my perspective correct, right? Because when we're talking about perception, although our perception feels real, and I don't want to discredit the fact that it feels real. You can't tell me I didn't. You're telling me that what I just saw was not real. I'm telling you it was real. But it was real to me, though it was fake. And there are things right now that we're facing that what we need is a correction in our perspective. This is how Jesus in Matthew 6, when he leads up to talking about seeking first the kingdom. This is how in Matthew 6, Jesus says, listen, the Gentiles worry about what they're going to eat. The Gentiles worry about what they're going to wear. The Gentiles worry about their lives. He says, but I need you to get your perspective and your perception altered. Because if you understood that you are a child of the king, that you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, then you wouldn't worry the way you do. Mm -hmm. And so this is why I say Jesus tells us to seek the kingdom, because when we seek the kingdom, it alters my perception. It alters my perspective. It, it gives me principles to live by. And as a result, it governs my practices. Because I am a child of the king. So now, with that being said, let's let's just see if we can extract some principles from the text. Because Jesus says in verse 15, there is nothing outside of a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Verse 17 says this. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. Now, this messed me up, Chuku. This messed me up. Jesus just, <laughs> he clearly says what goes in a person cannot defile him. His disciples come and say, you got to explain this to us. <laughs> Why? Because they had been indoctrinated so long that what I eat is what causes me to be defiled. There are Jews to this day think that eating kosher causes them to be clean. When Jesus is about to expose, hey, here's the issue. It's not what you're eating that's making you unclean. You know what's making you unclean? It's what's coming out of you. And, and if, if what's coming out of me makes me unclean, then, then here's the natural course of thought. Then what is in me? <laughs> What is in me that's defiling me? See, this is why I have to understand the nature of the heart. Because if I understand that my heart is defiled, then I will then submit to the way to get my heart clean. Whoa, is anybody getting encouraged today? Because I don't know about you, but I have lived a life where my heart was full of stuff that I didn't know how to get out. I didn't know how to get free of. But Jesus says, let's take a look. Remember, he's teaching kingdom and the purpose of the kingdom is that he wants to alter my perception. Because my perception is my reality. So in order for me, to ch for me to change my reality, my perception has to be converted. So the only way for my perception to be converted is I got to see kingdom because kingdom is going to correct my perspective. It's going to give me principles to live by. And it's going to allow me to then practice the things that are consistent with who I am. Can I speak to the child of God today? You are not the things that you do. You, you, I can go and stand in a garage all day long, but it won't make me a car. I can go and get into my wife's closet and get all those dresses that she have with the tag still hanging on them. Put that, that, that dress on, it may be a little tight and, and snug, 
But I'm getting into it. And I put me on some lipstick. Name a lipstick color for me. Help me. So, yeah, see, I'm, put that on. <laughs> And get me some a wig and boy and put me on some red bottoms and walk around bloody all day. But that don't make me a woman. So, so what Jesus is trying to help us to see is, hey, listen, if you've made Jesus Lord of your life, you are a kingdom citizen. Now I got to teach you to act like it. See, we're not going to get into it today, but I, I did a study on what did it take to become a U.S. citizen? And here's what I discovered. You got to go through some classes. They want you to learn some stuff because they don't want you just being here and not just bringing something to the table. Oh, I wish I had somebody who caught that. Not just occupying space, but that, hey, I need you to be a productive, contributing member of the society. I don't want you just to exist. I have a purpose, a calling, because if there's something special and unique about you, then you can bring something to the table. Come on, elbow your neighbor, neighbor, tell me you got something in you. Come on, tell somebody else. You got something in you. You I can't hear you. Tell them loud. Tell somebody behind you. You got something in you. Yeah, and the kingdom needs it. So Jesus is, is trying to break through this false perspective of life and he's telling his disciples look at this in in verse 18 he says and he said to them are you also without understanding jesus is surprised like <laughs> come on you? y'all been <laughs> come on now you don't get this jesus said, okay oh, let me let me explain it to you thank you lord i'm so glad cause this is me i'm one of the disciples you know Jesus didn't just didn't showed it to me, revealed it to me, sent me two uh, angel appearances. And I'm still like, I, didn't, I don't get it. <laughs> it's not it's not clicking. So Jesus says, since it enters. Li- listen, he says, then are you all without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Now, Jesus is not talking about uh, being healthy because there are certain things you sh- you are not putting your body. That's just in general, right? I, I, can't, I can't enjoy swine because if I eat it, it's going to mess my stomach up, right? And it, it could be the fact that swine eat anything. Okay, I knew I wasn't going to get no amen right there. <laughs> y'all look like, y'all look like I want my bacon. I don't, I don't care what you're saying. Okay. I want my bacon, Pastor. I, I, I do. Praise God. But look at what he says. He says, since it enters not his heart. There it is. Jesus is identifying. Here's where he, the defilement is, it's in the heart. You see it? And then he says, but his stomach, whatever goes into his mouth, goes into his stomach, not his heart. And he says, and it is expelled, right? You have a bowel movement and it, it, whatever you ate is gone, right? It went into the belly and it was processed, right? He says, thus he declared all foods clean, referring to certain foods. Again, you couldn't Jewish Law, they couldn't eat, right? Now, some of you, we, we, we not, some of us would not make good Jews. We just, <laughs> we just, we gonna eat whatever. It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm just gonna eat whatever I feel like eating, right? But, <laughs> but, but, but he says he's declaring all foods clean, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him, for from within, out of the heart of man. Come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. I just gave a pretty good little suite of things. And I don't know about you, but when I read the list, I was just like, "Mm." but I'm so glad the Bible says such were. Some of you. Okay. Can I praise God for? Can I? Oh, I'm gonna praise God by myself. Thank you, Lord. That the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who what are in Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. And so now I don't have to live under this 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 cloud of guilt and judgment because of the things that I used to do or the things that I used to be. I'm thankful that because of the kingdom of God, his perspective helps me to know that I've been washed clean. Hallelujah. So then 
Here is where we land. Jesus says, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So if all of that stuff is coming up out of me, then Jesus, what is your point in teaching kingdom from this? It's because Jesus is altering my perception, my perspective. He's given me principles to live my life. And those principles govern my practices. So then I want to give you a couple of thoughts really quick. If, if you're at a place where you realize, man, pastor, you name some of those things and some of those things are bubbling up out of my heart. See, if you, if you went to the doctor and, and they, did, they ran an exam on you, and they, they hooked you up with the EKG and they test the beat and the rhythm of your heart. And there was a discern, a discerning issue. And they told you, we, we think that there may be some blockage. Every one of us here, every one of us that are online would say, you know what? I got to do something about that because this is what you call uh, catching it early. And I want to address that. So I want to give you a couple of tools to help you address your wildly heart. First of all, you got to see that it's evil. You got to know that your heart, my heart, your baby, cute baby, your baby's beautiful baby heart is evil. Not because Pastor Terrence said it, but because the Bible says it. That the heart, listen, this is why Jeremiah said it. He said, listen, he said, your heart is deceitful. <laughs> the human heart cannot be trusted. You ought to look at your human heart like you do a salesman. You walk, mm -mm, no, I don't trust you. Anybody ever experienced that? You walk into the sales office and they want trying to be your friend. Nope, we don't have to be friends, brother. Because at the end of the day, if you don't give me my price, I don't care who your mommy is. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Right? So, so we have to know that the human heart cannot be trusted. Many have been led to rebellion, disobedience, and great sorrow by following their heart. Without challenging their heart. See, here's what we, we, we must know. Instead of complying with what naturally responds out of my heart. Listen, I have to challenge my heart and I have to measure it by the king's perspective. So if it violates the king's perspective, then the king is not wrong. I am. Right? This is why the psalm says it this way. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But y'all help me. But his delight, help me, is in where? It's in the law of the Lord. Why? Because God's law is designed to protect me. When I don't know which way to go, the word of God will direct me. Right. So I, I, I must use the word of God like a like a plumb line. It's the standard. Right. By which I govern my life. I've told this story before, but I, I, uh, I went to build a, um, a little platform, cousin, for my uh, my storage shed and I measured it. I measured it. It said 82 inches. I said, OK, got it. Got it. I measured it again. Chuku and Chuku, you could probably help me, man, because Chuku is a master carpenter. And so when I was measuring it, I was like, OK, 82. I measured it, I said, 82. Got it. Went to Home Depot. I said, look here. Need some wood. For 82 inches, right? <clears throat> so when I got home, laid my wood out. I said, yep, yeah, it's 82 inches. All right, praise God. I got, I got it. So I'm putting together the wood. And, and vaguely, I remember seeing Madison, this little device that some of the woodworkers would use called a leveler. And I thought to myself, I don't need no leveler. All I need to do is just look at it. <laughs> and that's how, that's how you look at stuff when you. So, you know, so I'm looking at it. I'm trying, okay, I got it. I got it. So I'm putting it together, Kim, and, and, and man, I'm putting the wood in. I'm, I'm hammering, but I'm feeling like Bob the Builder, boy. I got my. <laughs> I'm hammering, man. I'm like, man, I'm working. And boy, I got ready to put my storage shed back on top of the foundation that I had just built. Using my perspective. And boy, I slid that storage unit on there. And that mug was, 
striking the poles. It was all crooked. <laughs> it, was, it was hanging off the side. I, and I just couldn't understand. I'm looking like, what? Now, where did I go wrong? I know what it was. Home Depot gave me the wrong measurement. <laughs> and you know what I discovered? It wasn't Home Depot. It wasn't that the storage unit had shifted. My perception of what looked right was off. And a lot of us right now, our perception is off. We've learned things a certain way. So Jesus says, I need you to seek the kingdom because the kingdom is going to help correct what you learned that wasn't true. So then, first thing I want to encourage you to do is understand that your heart is desperately wicked. It's deceitful and it cannot be trusted. And so instead of complying with our heart, we must challenge our heart and measure it against the king's perspective. Second thing I want to encourage you to do is understand that the human heart requires regular renewal. Romans, Paul tells the church at Rome, he says, listen, be not conformed to this world system. Why, Paul? Because while you may be in this world, you're not of this world. While you may live in the United States, you have a higher kingdom that you are subject to called the kingdom of God. And so it doesn't matter what the what the kingdom of the United States dictate. You still have a governance that's not based on the United States alone. Jesus says, seek first. There are things about the United States that's OK. It's cool. But then there are other things that say, nope, I can't go with it because the kingdom that I'm submitted to is higher than yours. So then I must regularly renew my heart. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be what? Transform how? By the renewing of your mind. Why? Because your perception has to be changed. And if last thing I want to give to you as we close up is that the scripture says that the heart is deceptively wicked. Who can understand it? Seek God for wisdom. Family, I want to call attention to the fact that in the kingdom of God, there is government designed to govern my life to provide protection for me. To give me practical principle for life on this side to alter my perception that give me and clearly give me principles and practices that will determine the quality of my life here on earth and the life to come. So you see there are many of us today that may be living in this world unaware that there is a world to come, unaware that someday we will stand before God. We will have to give an account for the life that we've li lived here on earth. You see, in the kingdom of God, there is a judicial process. And, and the judge cannot be swayed, cannot be convinced without the attorney who can stand in proxy for you. And this attorney that I'm referring to is an attorney who has never lost a case. This attorney uh, knows the law of the kingdom. And he understands that because of his spilled blood, because of his sacrifice, all who are in Christ are acquitted of all wrong. So when you stand before God, will you have that attorney on your side named Jesus who will plead your case to the father? And when the father looks at you, he would not see all your sins, all your guilt and shame, all the evil that has bubbled up out of your heart. But he'll see a vessel that is covered by the blood of Jesus washed white as snow. If that's you today, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner 
I know that without you, I am lost. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, what I want to invite you to do, I want to extend the invitation to you, is to let us know. Contact us. Let us know we, we, I have given my heart to Jesus. And that's just the beginning to becoming and understanding what it is to be a kingdom citizen. Can we give God some praise today? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, family, we thank you so much for giving us a little extra time today to really try to establish uh, this, this um, sermon series called Pursuit. And um, for those of you who are joined us online, uh, we thank you so much for your presence here. We're going to end our broadcast at this time. We'd love to um, make contact with you. Please reach out to us. Um, for those of us who are still here,